Notice the journeys. Notice the struggles. Notice the success. Notice that we are much more than just athletes. You've heard the stories, but not quite like this. New episodes weekly on Thursday. It's time for the world to take notice. Take notice, episode five. I'm your host, Dwayne Notice, and I got somebody who I revere, somebody I look up to, one of the best in the business, who is an anchor for a TSN on Sports Center, and is somebody who's an inspiration inspiration to me and continues to pave the way in journalism in the space without compromising her integrity. Kayla Gray, somebody that I've been trying to get this interview with off for a while, <laughs> finally gotten it done. So I'm excited. How you doing? I'm good. I'm like also kind of shook that you're like, look up to it. I'm like, we're probably the same age. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not yet 30. So <laughs> nah, to me, it's like when I, I it's, it's crazy because I have a lot of teammates that I kind of look up to who are like maybe a year or two older than me. But I don't really equate looking up to somebody as in like an age aspect. I also look into it. If you provide inspiration for me, no matter how old you are, then you serve as a mentor to me. Don't matter. Like my brother is a couple years younger than me, but I look up to him in a lot of ways um, just because of how he handles things in adversity. So I don't really equate it to age. I appreciate you, but you hit me with the Miss Gray that one time when we first connected, and I was like, "So what we not about to do is this?" No, I I'd be no. Polite, politically correct. I didn't want to. I know, I know. I'm kidding. I'm, I'm kidding. It's all love. It's all respect. Okay, so basically, it's the it's the warm up right now. Um, I just want to ask you, what's your cultural background? and a little bit more about yourself. My mom came here when she was 14 years old. She went to George's Henry, uh, which is in Toronto. Uh, and then along the shore had me, uh, North York General Hospital. Mm -hmm. I was born and raised, I guess, in like the North York area, but grew up kind of borderline Scarborough. I rep Scarborough really hard. Hey. Um, and so, yeah, that, that, that was me. But also I was like the troubled child. I was the girl <laughs> that would be at Scarborough Town Center every Tuesday <laughs> for the discounted movies and like the discounted Tuesdays. AFC, like that. that. Tuesday Tuesdays. One year, one year the Tuesday Tuesday fell on Valentine's Day. And when I tell you that mall was packed, anyways. So I, I mean, that was that, that a little bit about my upbringing. I say that just to say I was the troubled child. So like I went to Domino's Collegiate, got kicked out, went to Victoria Park collegiate got kicked out mm. um graduated and had to like upgrade all my marks at like an adult learning center like it is crazy that I ended up here but by God's grace your girl got back on track <laughs> and she here she is I mean it's not I always hear it's not about the destination but it's about the journey so it's pretty good that you're able to kind of deal with all that and still end up where you are and still have so much far to go did you play sports or were you just always into sports just based off of watching yeah, so I like tell this story all the time. So I grew up um, when I was at middle school, I went to my grandparents' house all the time and like through elementary school as well. And my grandparents are so old school. So like my grandma would watch the Blue Jays games on wow. television, but she would have it on mute. And then my grandfather would be watch would be listening to the games, but he'd have the radio call playing. And like, just like the fusion of it was like insane to me. And then it was like Mondays and Thursdays would be our rest. So, I mean, sports is always something that, that was a part of my life to watch. I always knew I wanted to be a part of it because I was just like, man, like, how are these Jays, and we're talking like past like 93 Jays, yeah. trash Jays seasons, like black uniform season. I'm like, how are these Blue Jays still getting run a commercial so hype? My grandmother, yeah, I, <laughs> I don't understand it, but I knew I just wanted to be a part of it. And then, um, you know, growing up, I played a lot of soccer, mm. um, played basketball, played flag football. And I still want to be like a safety, like Troy Polamalu. But you know, like with yourself, how you're like, you know, when you're good, you're like, yeah, man, I think I'm pretty special. Like, I knew pretty early I was terrible and trash. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, you know what, Gray? I feel like you, you're better talking about sports than playing sports. So that's what I kind of like transitions to, to kind of more writing about it and, and kind of taking... I don't know, I became very passionate about like storytelling and like watching other people just like thrive in the space. So I was, I, I was a happy spectator as a sports person. Oh, that's amazing. So it's basically, you just made that transition on your own. And did you have any mentors at the time um, before you got into the journalism space? Like I know me growing up, just watching Raptors games, Chuck Squirsky, like just hearing him always made me think like, wow, if I was a broadcaster, I want to have catchphrases as cool as he does. 
Um, oh my gosh. Watching stuff like that. So did you have any mentors that kind of helped you get into the space that you are in now? Not really. Like high school going through it. Remember, teachers hated my guts. Like I was the one that was getting sent to the principals. <laughs> <laughs> this is terrible to say. Um, but there were some teachers along the way that did help me. They're like, yo, if you want to get into sports, like try writing here or there and try doing some recaps and stuff. So like that really helped. Um, this can, I might also get in trouble for this, but I've always, always said it. I was the one that streamed the ESPN feeds. Mm -hmm. um, so I could watch like anchors that look like me on television because in Canada, there just simply were none. So those yeah. were my teachers, even though they didn't know that they were my teachers. Shout out to Robert <laughs> uh, Waters. But it's, it's just like, when you think about people that you looked up to, for me, I had to like illegally look for people to look up to. Um, and yep. so for sure, um, when it comes to mentors, they're very unconventional. Yeah. Okay. That, yeah, that makes sense. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, I understand what you He's mean. Like, yeah, you laugh. You laugh and you're like, yo, she about to get this thing shut <laughs> down. <laughs> no, no, I understand what you mean. Cause take I never like. Notice. Take notice and take notes, kids. Don't be streaming ESPN feeds. <laughs> By cable. Yeah, live cable. But back then, they weren't even showing that many, you know, different sport, like sports on our television. So I can't blame you. For no. At all. No. And then it was like, what? Me coming up was like around times that the Raptors were coming up. So so tickets were pretty reasonable at that time. Even going to Jays games, tickets were reasonable. So I'd be like in those spaces. But kind of front row? Yeah, no. I was not front row. I was not talking to Chuck. Nope, nope, nope. <laughs> To go back to your first question of like where I've come from, kind of like my struggle, it took me a long, long time to say my real story out loud. Okay. And I feel like I was so scared, especially starting out in the industry, because I was scared that everybody would label me as like the typical black girl or whatever stereotype that they had around black women, black people mm -hmm. um, at that time. And eventually, and that was the struggle for me was just like, owning who I was, owning my truth, owning my voice, owning how I talk, owning how I communicate and showing up fully as myself. That's a hard, that was the hardest for me to do. Mm -hmm. But then before that, what was incredibly tough was making room for myself. There was like no other person doing it that looked like me. Exactly. And so I never, ever, ever thought that I could even have a seat at the table. Like when I first got out of journalism school, I went to Winnipeg, little girl from Scarborough heading to Winnipeg for her first job. And the program director told me like someone that looks like you should be lucky that you even have a job. Wow. And that was my very first experience. And I was faced with like, okay, am I going to stay or am I going to go? Like, do yeah. I compromise my integrity or do I stick this out? What? keep going to a very unsafe workspace and I chose to leave and I thought I would get blackballed from the industry but then I moved further northwest to Prince Rupert British Columbia and I really wow. really was doing everything out there I was editing my stuff shooting my own stuff so it's interesting because now we're in these COVID times and I'm like going back to the basics of like setting up my own shot and my own set and all yeah. that stuff but it really allowed me to really hone my own craft and then coming back to Toronto, because a lot of people don't know this, but I came back to Toronto and worked for TSN as a radio producer. Wow. So I like built my way up to yeah. on air and to what I've been doing now. And, you know, when I think about it and I think back to this original struggle of hiding my truth because I was scared it would make people feel uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. All of the crap that I went through growing up, all the struggles, all the hurdles, like it built me for this. Like I am not built to flinch. Like I am a born grown hustler like that is what i do and you need that like an element like in this industry when you're going after jobs or interviews or what have you so i mean what i thought was a struggle really turned out to be a blessing in the long run well, a lot of people can benefit from that including myself so i'm <laughs> glad, you, glad you stuck with it okay so this is part of the interview is notice my steez and notice my steez is basically i'm asking probably about five Ten questions about your favorite stuff just to get to know you a little better so first one is what is your favorite book of all time oh my gosh so there's two tony morris and the bluest eye um love that book recommend it one that i will say is my favorite favorite because i read it every single year like a little nerd is the power of now okay um it's, it's just one of those books that just like, I, I'm born January 2nd, Capricorn energy. 
Um, and so at the top of the year, I like to just kind of remind myself of the importance of being present. Mm. I feel like this job is so, it depends. Like I work in live events. That's a space where you're in I mean, normally, but you play the game. So you have to be incredibly present. Yeah. Um, and so sometimes when you're not used to like have that athletic mindset of like, all right, stop by stop, second by second, play yeah. by play you get so ahead of yourself or you get so caught up with what happened that it's so hard to stay present. So this book like essentially kind of breaks down the importance of that and the importance of kind of like not being so ahead of yourself, not being so wrapped up in what happened or what could have been, mm -hmm. but just sort of like really settling in the now. So I read that every single year just to kind of get back to get back to the foundation. Oh wow, okay. Favorite artist of all time. Oh God, this is terrible. <laughs> It's going to be weird, but like Kendrick Lamar and, and J. Cole to okay. me, I just think they're, I think they're both dope. Um, and I can listen to them at like, at like any time and I get hype. Um, favorite artist right now? God, there's so many like new artists. I'm like, who the hell is a, what is a Gotti? What is that? <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> oh my God, I'm going to get ripped apart for that. I just got that. Um, favorite artist right now, gosh, I don't know, TBD on that. Okay. Over the last, like, month or so, I've been listening to this group called Rye. Okay. And I don't know, it's just been the vibe that I've been in. They're a really, really cool group. It's, like, all, it's weird sounding to those that are in, like, the hip-hop crowd, but, like, for me, I kind of, like, float genres, so yeah. that's who I'm listening to right now. Okay. Favorite You're like, yeah, all right. <laughs> nah, nah, I don't know nothing about Rye, but I'm going to check him out. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to get you on it. Okay. Uh, favorite hobby? Oh, gosh. <laughs> favorite hobby? I don't, I don't. Watching sports? Okay. <laughs> like that. No, nah, it, it, I feel like that's a, so. It, it, <laughs> When you're watching sports for work, it's completely different than when you're watching it just for fun. Like for me, when I'm watching it for work, like there is like hours of prep that go into it and it doesn't suck the fun out of it. It's still fun, but like you're watching with a purpose. So you're paying attention to so many different things all for a bigger goal, right? Of like delivering the news. When I'm watching sports for fun, that's when Ratchet Kayla comes out on the timeline. As you know, I can't help myself with Twitter. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah. so I mean, it, it's a hobby of mine. Other than that, I love to, like, work out, go for walks, okay. chill with my son. Um, oh, my gosh. I can't believe I, like, put my son third in the list. I love my kid. Let's be clear. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, and, yeah, th those are the things I like to do. Okay. Favorite interview you ever conducted? Allen Iverson. You got to speak to Bubba? Listen, there is not... <laughs> Toronto, when he was here for, in Toronto for the for All-Star break, there is not an athlete, and I don't know why, like, there are that you can, like, stand in awe of and appreciate what they do, that body of work. Um, Kobe's of the world also there's only like a select few that like can get you incredibly starstruck yeah Alan Iverson for me <laughs> that is someone who made me fall in love with the game of basketball and, and really like it, it was more than just what I saw on the court it was more about like who he was and who he was you feel comfortable with him being in his it was just like the whole package for me and to like see him up close in person, like going over like certain like memories that he's had. Step, you know, the step overs, crossing up Jordan, like all these like different like iconic moments and retelling that to me was just like insane. And so we were able to get kind of one-on-ones with him. And he had, it was like he had all the time in the world for whoever was in front of him. And so I would ask him questions and he would, obviously respond but he'd be so thoughtful and careful with his words and just like just like a good dude just a good dude he's exactly who i thought he would be in person so that was my favorite that's my favorite interview that's awesome because like growing up obviously i love alan iverson bubba chuck like 
just the heart of a giant, just being able to cross those bridges between being like a cultural icon and then bring it in with sports. Mm -hmm. And then it's like the way the media like kind of painted him throughout his career, it kind of like kind of tainted his image. So the fact that you're saying that he's like a stand up guy and you're meeting him one on one, it just like means the world. It just shows you like how much of an impact he had on everybody else. Yeah. Despite and y'all don't y'all don't care about what us media folks say. <laughs> Come on now. <laughs> exactly. Listen, I, I well, Eddie's the one who's so highly revered amongst like guys in the NBA right now. Like yeah. I was at All Star Break in Chicago, and like it was just beautiful to see. Like you know, guys are coming off the court, and we're kind of like in the tunnel at the back, and he just goes up to Dame, and they're just like hugging for like five minutes straight, and I'm like, my God, like. And he's like, yo, I love you. Like, just that, like, genuine respect amongst right. players, former and current. Like, it doesn't matter what we have to say, honestly. Like, it, it really doesn't matter. Like, those that know the game know, right? Know. Yeah. Okay. All right, last one. What is your favorite meal to cook and favorite meal to eat? Lord have mercy. <laughs> favorite meal to cook... I make a mean jerk chicken, like real jerk chicken, not like the soft season jerk chicken. I'm okay. Yeah. Favorite meal that I won't even try to cook because no matter how hard I try, it will never be better than my mom's oxtail. Like hands down, hands down. Oxtail and and fried snapper. Okay, and those and because I'm I've Jamaican tried to well. cook fried. I'm Jamaican as well. So North you know. North, like, so you know. Real particular. You can't, you can't mess those things up or it's, it's not going to. You know. And so why, so why even try? So yeah. why even try? Like, I can fry dumpling. I can make ackee and saltfish. I can do the fritters. I can do all the curry. Go all of that stuff I can do. But the specific, the stuff where it gets really particular and specific. Yeah. You leave it for your mom to do and you don't touch it. You just don't touch it. <laughs> and before I continue, why is it always that Jamaicans, I feel like, especially like my grandma, like she'll make all these bomb meals, but she never like the, the recipe is never written down anywhere. And it's like, I, cause oh, I no. nope, nope. <laughs> like, nope. Never, yeah. Do you know how many times I've asked my mom? I'm like, yo mom, send me the oxtail recipe. She said, nope. <laughs> and I figure the reason why they do that is so that we, the children keep on coming back. Ah, I never looked at it like that. Ah, well, it? now you know. When you're, you know, speaking on race-related issues and speaking so constantly about um, the stuff that's going on in the world and trying to educate people on race-related issues, does that take a toll on you mentally, especially you having a mainstream platform and receiving, you know, all the, the eyes that you can get when it comes to you saying stuff? All the eyes, the voices, the hate that I can get. Yeah, I, I think it does. And um, I think, you know, Black women, we, it's crazy. Like, I was just watching SNL over the weekend, and we're seeing, like, Megan Thee Stallion do her thing and, you know, call out um, Daniel Cameron mm -hmm. and, you know, calling him a sellout this and the third. But then we forget, like, what Megan also went through. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, the trauma that just recently faced. And I feel like even though it's not on that scale, I can compare that to what black women go through on the daily. It's like dealing with our own trauma, watching, you know, black women, Breonna Taylor, not be valued, our lives not be valued, but in heading to the front of the movement to be as vocal as possible. Yeah. And that does take a mental toll because it's, it, I can't explain continuously open up your phone and see people that look like you brutalized. Yeah. And it's, it's heartbreaking. Um, but I always think back to when I first saw the murder of George Floyd. And I think I honestly was like 30 seconds said to myself, yo, Kayla, if you get fired from this point on, Mm -hmm. about anything you say because you are going to have to find some words to say and you are not going to let your foot off the pedal then so be it we'll yeah. deal with it when we get there and I think like when I came to that realization that I was ready because the stakes were just far too high like what I did submit to put in perspective was okay you might lose your job but like somebody lost his life yeah. like that's someone who will not go back to their their kids or their family right so I think for me like it only made sense to use my platform it's the very least I can do um 
but for me also, what's very important for me is that I'm not just using the 280 characters afforded to me on Twitter. It's what I'm doing behind the scenes. It's how I'm advocating behind the scenes and how I am showing up for my community behind the scenes. So I think it's incredibly important, but these are the things that of course keep me up at night Mm -hmm. Um, because I think it's like the black woman's way to make sure everybody's good. And then you toss in the fact that, you know, I am raising a son, um, and I, and I worry, you know, I, I worry, um, and I am lucky enough to be around the game, um, which kind of puts me around predominantly black people and you are, your proximity is so close. So it becomes a little bit deeper than just kind of regular interactions right those are your people at the end of the day so yeah it's it, it does take a mental toll and i'm lucky that I kind of had this opportunity to have interviews with people to talk about social injustice issues but for me i just don't want that to ever go in vain and so it's always like how do you take it one step further so it's not just a conversation and there's action behind it too so so yeah the long or the short <laughs> No, that's awesome. And I have, you know, two baby sisters who are eight and six years old, you know, beautiful black princesses that are going out to be queens. And um, last year uh, on air, you mm-hmm. made this effort to wear braids on television. Um, was that something that you premeditated and was, you know, wearing braids on TV, especially in the climate that we're in, just being, you know, uh, black people having that, you know, I guess stigma of we can't wear the certain hairstyles that we want to wear that is for the lack of better words is popularized in mainstream media wherever you go and it's always being appropriated um were Mm -hmm. you faced with any criticism or did you get any reception from doing that on air how was that experience yeah like you know i go back to when i made my debut on sports center became the first black woman to host a canadian sports highlight show Mm-hmm. Um, I was eight and a half months pregnant <laughs> and oh. black <laughs> and coming out to an audience essentially that was used to things being a certain way. And so yeah. for me, I was like, girl, if you go find your confidence, here is the time to do it. Yeah. Um, so I just had to keep going. Now, I'm not going to lie and say that there aren't some things that I, or that there are some things that I do that don't have intention and meaning behind them, like wearing my hair a certain way. Yeah. Because when you look up professional and unprofessional, usually professional, you're going to see white, straight, light hair. And then unprofessional, you're going to see dreads, you're going to see black, you're going to see natural hair. You can't tell me if I wear my hair natural or in braids, it's not professional. Yeah. And I think what stunts all the haters on Twitter when it comes to me is I'm good at my job. Like I'm good at what I do. Yeah. And so people love to claim token and they love to say all these things about me, but it's like, yo, check the re- seats like I'm great at what I do exactly and that's not just cocky it's just me being incredibly clear as to why I'm here and what I'm doing Mm -hmm. and so when I know that I show up in that realm of like ability and capability and what I do on paper then I start to do intentional shit after that right like (laughs) then I start to to use my platform for other things and then I start to okay well, while we say in this message, we're also going to get this message. Young girls that see me, you're going to see me in braids and you're going to know that if you want to wear your hair in this style, you could do it too. Yeah. Don't let anybody take that from you. And so I think that, yeah, I think in that, in that sense, I'm incredibly intentional because I never saw it for myself and I want the young girls out there to see someone that looks like them up there because mm-hmm. Frankly, I, I need someone to be better than like I want someone to be to come up to do what I'm doing, but to go further than me. Yeah. Like that's like the biggest that to me I think should be what everyone's dream is, is that they lay down enough groundwork so that the next generation can take that torch and like run with that. Like mm-hmm. run with it and not look back. Like that's why it's you know, when you when you think about where we are right now, like we're not special, we're not unique. We've mm-hmm. had people that have come before us. We've yeah. had people that have before me that have laid down the blueprint that have laid down the work and have kind of given you the tools of like here's how you navigate these spaces and so for me I just want to play a part and like the bigger goal which is to just have everybody black win (laughs) (laughs) I like that that's great rooting for everybody black (laughs) (laughs) exactly now I couldn't you know let this interview go about without mentioning this my mother is a huge first of all she's a huge fan of you 
but she's also a huge fan of <laughs> <laughs> She's also a huge, a few, a huge fan of Amazing Race, and I saw that you were, you know, Etox correspondent for season seven, and then you kind of transitioned to having, you know, hosting your own show with Amazing Race Canada, the ride along. How was that experience being mm -hmm. a host for for that show? I'm, I'm telling you, my mother's workplace. I promise you, for the past like 20 years or however long the show's been going on for, I don't know, but they've been. It feels like forever. They've they've always have like a bet. The Amazing Race Canada. Amazing Race Canada for me, amazing experiences because I was able to do that before the Toronto Raptors championship run. So it was amazing for me to go around the country and then to come back to my home base and kind of see that win of a championship. It was, it, I don't know. I, I don't think timing could have been better. But I think it was also important because we talk about representation. So when you think about travel and you think about these shows, you don't really see black people in that space yeah. and kind of in leads in that space. And so for me to host my own show where I was going to Yellowknife, Nova Scotia, BC, I was doing all the wild things. I was kayaking, I was zip lining, like, but, and it's like, you know, for me, I was like, I've never done this stuff before, but I'm going to definitely try. And I don't think that black people talk about travel enough and we should. And I think it's because we don't talk about it enough because we're so busy working, right? Like we are, we, that's what we do. We are, we are excellent and we work and we grind and we hustle. It's in our DNA, but it's very hard for a lot of us to, to have that chill and relax, right? Because of the way that white supremacy works, the way that systemic racism works is it, it, it robs your joy, right? So I think when I do those things and I have that opportunity to have that joy and to be spontaneous and to go jet skiing and to do all kind of foolishness to me, like that helped also give permission for other black people to do the same and to get out there and to and to have that joy and to try that new experience because I, I got to tell you, like, it deepens and enriches your sense of, of life, of environment, um, your awareness of this country. And I think everyone needs to do it. Everyone needs to travel, yeah. specifically with, with, with Black people. A lot of Black people, like, they, they are traveling. I don't want to say that there are not Black women because there, there is a ton, actually, that own the travel space but yep. i think they could also agree that more needs to be in that space as well more people need to be backpacking and exploring because for me my sense of travel was okay <laughs> scarborough downtown toronto <laughs> and maybe jamaica every once once every yeah. couple of years but i had no idea of of the different spaces in canada and so that when i say um, that that's exactly what I mean. And I think that having my own show and, and kind of showcasing that was really important for me because I wanted people in the audience to be like, all right, this might be something I want to try out too. Yeah, I think that's incredible. I, I know, you know, playing basketball, I get to travel a lot, especially playing for Team Canada. And I just remember being a young kid, just playing for the junior men's national team. And we traveled to like Czech Republic and Brazil mm. and Italy and all these places. And I would be like, always confined to being in the hotel room because I want to be on Wi-Fi. And at the time, Facebook was popping. And so I'm like trying to be on Facebook. And it wasn't until my mother, yeah. basically what you said, which was take advantage of traveling, like go out there, take pictures, sightsee, experience the food. Like I was always trying to eat like a burger, or like an American and I, American. And I food. <laughs> and now that I'm older, the more I get to travel and see that we can't take it for granted. I, I like to enjoy my experiences when I'm out there. So that's good that you were able to do the backpacking and the jet and all the, the foolishness, as you said. <laughs> <laughs> the foolishness. Your, your girl went to cottage country for the first time in her life. And she's like, Oh, this is uh, like, Growing up, when all my white friends would tell me they were going to the cottage, I was like, what is this country that everyone keeps going to? Yeah. I figured out what a cottage was, guys. I learned what a cottage was in 2019 at my big old age. <laughs> oh, wow. Okay, so we talked about it earlier, but you said you basically have two different Kaylas when you're watching, you know, sports. You have the fan and the one that's basically preparing to prep or to deliver a show. So how do you balance, especially for someone like me who's hoping to be in the space that you're in, how do you balance being a reporter and being a fan? Oh, God. Well, we're going to say you will be in this space because we like to speak things into existence around here. But um, I, it's, it's, I don't know. Like, for me, when I arrive at, like, game day, let's say, I'm always 
prepping. So it's like maybe like three hours or so of prep. I'm the loser that records games and watches them back and wow. loves to go to practice. And, you know, I, 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 I honestly, I say that and I don't want it to ever sound boring because to me, I find so much joy in doing it. Like storytelling to me is something I've, uh, that is my purpose. I love to storytell. Um, and so that's what I take incredibly serious because it's my craft. And, and I always want to be growing and getting better in that sense. There are so many games like that where, um, you know, we can think back to Philly, Toronto, game seven, the four bounces. Like there's so many games throughout a regular season that I'm sure you've also been a part of as well, where it's like your fandom takes over and it needs to take over because God forbid someone hits a game winning shot and you're hitting them with like some like stats. Like yeah. nobody cares about the stats. That's yeah. it, I, it infuriates me at this point when you see a game like that come down to the wire, someone hits a go ahead and then it's like, you're asking them about like stats that are so irrelevant to the yeah. moment. Yeah. That is where the fandom, that's where the fandom needs to kick in because as you know, in those moments, Sometimes it's not even what you see. It's not even the play that you see. It's like feel at that point. Like at some at some point, it's just like the feel of the game just takes over, right? And so um, I guess to go back to your question, like sometimes the two don't, it can't be separate because then to me, you lose that element of, of, of emotion, which is why we get into this game in the first place, right? It's why we're in this space in the first place is the emotion as fans. So um, to me, that's when they, when they um, are together. Now, when it comes to fan and professional, I think that I keep them incredibly separate in my workspace, but I am a fan of, of sports. So of course, emotion will take over. And when I'm at home, emotion, that's all emotion driven. Yeah. Speaking of being a fan, I was fortunate enough to, you know, play with the Raptors 9 5 the past two seasons. So I've been kind of intertwined with uh, the actual Toronto Raptors, you know, the, the the actual parent team. And, you know, I'm 26 now, born in 94. So the Raptors were established in 95. Um, seeing the incredible run of how they are able to finally achieve that, that championship uh, and being, you know, teammates with some of the players on the team and having mentors and being able to work out with them, I got to actually attend the parade. And I know you hosted the parade. What was that experience like hosting the parade? Because I know attending the parade was <laughs> madness. It was outstanding. It was just, it was supposed to be like a two hour drive of Lakeshore and it ended up being like a five and a half hour thing. It was crazy. It was so ready. Now here comes the bomb. You're 94, I'm 93. Oh, wow. So I, I know. Oh, oh. <laughs> Do you not know that? Yeah, I'm the, well, I think I've always said it. I'm, I'm the baby, like the baby. So, but that all goes to say, I grew up with the team as did you. Um, and so for me, that was like the craziest thing. Like we had planned our broadcast for three hours. Yeah. And that joint lasted eight hours. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Now I was stuck on a bus with your boy, Norm and yeah. Chris Boucher and yeah. Danny Green. Now, yeah. you know, <laughs> you know <laughs> Norman Powell on that parade, okay? Yeah. He was living his best life. Danny was living his best life. Chris was living his best, everybody was living their best life. Yeah. I was drinking water the entire time. <laughs> yeah. That is where you should feel sorry for me, okay? <laughs> um, no, but I, I say that all to say, it was like one of the craziest, it was one of the craziest moments. Like I was looking into the crowd and it was so loud. It was so loud. I didn't think that, I mean, I knew people were, were going to come out, but I didn't think that many people were going to come out. Either. It was like, there were I did not people, think it would be that packed, but what was I beautiful mean, we, about There was people like, in the. I remember we went, because my mom lives on Lakeshore, and I remember her saying that, like, I'm on the balcony and I could see mm -hmm. you guys going by. Because I, um, I was on the bus with Marc Gasol <laughs> and Eric Moreland and Jeremy Lynn. Yeah, oh, you were on the fun bus. The fun bus. And the funniest story about you that. You were on the fun bus. When I got onto the bus, um, me and my, my boy, Mikhail, and his little brother, Micah, and I was with Jordan Lloyd, and basically, which is the guy in the suit, but we were on the bus, and Mark Gasol came on and said, I have a flight later today. I'm going back to Spain, and his wife and his kids were there, so he's like, I'm not drinking. Like, I'm not. I'm just going to, you know, just wave to the fans, and he turned up being the, the most lit one out of everybody. <laughs> he was going crazy. 
Oh, we knew. Oh, oh, you weren't drinking, so that was just grape juice. We had communion, Mark. All right, cool. Hmm. Oh man, interesting, cool. Yeah, so late. It, it was, was in. He, yo, he was. Mark was turned. Yeah, we like this Marcus. <laughs> Marcus was turned. I don't know what Pinot. I don't know what type of drink you guys Pinot Noir he was drinking, but whatever that is, send that my way. Thank you so much. <laughs> it was like. It was crazy because like I was looking into the crowd and it was like, because I'm from Scarborough, Toronto, like a big reunion. Like I was seeing people I went to West Scarborough Boys and Girls Club with, like it was insane, insane. Wow. Okay. So you just dropped the bombshell that we're like basically the same age. Um, so, <laughs> but it's, it's insanely Isn't incredible. That terrifying? Like, nah, it's just like, it just speaks like, highly of how talented you are especially at what you do like i'm thinking you had like 10 years wait of- how old wait how old how old do you think i was well i'm not i'm not gonna get myself in trouble my mother told me never to talk about a woman nah, nah. <laughs> now now i'm putting now i'm putting you on the spot now who's um, interviewing who i definitely thought you were like like almost 30 like touching 30 not because it looks, but because of, but not because of the way you look, just but because of your professionalism. Like when you, when you, when I see, yeah, you, I, you I, 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 I do carry myself like a like a grown ass woman. I'm not gonna <laughs> lie, but that is because <laughs> I I moved out of my house at 15, okay. so I've always had to kind of adult my way through life. So I, I understand why people can think. Um, yeah, so yeah, 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 yeah. As a role model. What are some of the things that you hope to accomplish in your career? Ooh, okay. I'm starting to say this one out loud. It's always been a dream of mine. Um, but I want to open a community center. So okay. we're going to say that out loud. Um, other things. It's crazy. Like, people think if they ask me that question, uh, when it comes to my career, it'll be stuff that is, related to things that benefit me like one day hosting the NBA finals or whatever like all that stuff's nice but like for me where I'm at is what I do in my opinion as much as I love to tell the stories of other people it's still like kind of self-serving right like I like to hear myself talk it's an ego driven it's an ego driven career And, and that's fine like that is totally fine I think when on air talent get a little bit more like real about that then we can all move forward <laughs> yeah. but what I do is is ego driven it, like that's the I I like being on tv otherwise yeah. I wouldn't do it like I I you know and and that's gonna sound cocky to some but like it is what it is for me, the goal is to some way along this journey, figure out how best I can serve okay. uh, and turn my selfish work into selfless work. Um, and I think that's the hardest thing for a lot of people to do is to figure out how they are meant to show up in the world as a servant. Um, and so for me, I think what I would love to do is open space or a space in general um, for the young 15 year olds like me who were living on their own um, and trying to navigate life and all of the, the hiccups and obstacles along the way like I I think that to me career wise eventually that's where I want to end up I mean because I can't meet them. I'm gonna get old um, and and that's that is fine aging is beautiful um, but I do want to figure out a way to make my work meaningful um, and that to me is like legacy play. So if it's kind of either creating courses or ha- helping more young black women and men get into this field and help them feel safe and supported and give them kind of like the scope and the tools to navigate this space, but like not to like play the game. Uh, yeah. Because I mean, as you know, even, even on the other side of the mic, playing the game of basketball the game, the game. There's always politics, right? Yeah. And so yeah. for me, I'm kind of like I would love to. Yeah, I mean, you, I know. Um, for me, I would kind of like to deal with that politics part, so that the people coming in after me don't have to. They don't have to navigate or or translate or or code switch. Mm-hmm. So for me, it's like I guess long term goal is figuring out a way to morph all of those things that I just said. Um, that's amazing so we're near the end of the interview and we're gonna play a game called put on notice 
and it's basically this or that. And I'm gonna oh, put Lord. 24 seconds on the shot clock, and I'm gonna ask you, yeah, this or that questions. Okay, ready? Okay, fine. Okay. Okay, let's do this. Aaliyah or Beyonce? Oh, come on, <laughs> Dwayne! Like, run the clock. Just violation. Are you uh, serious? Okay. All right, we go. Time out. Okay, time out. What? Who? Who? Yo, you? like, yo, you can't hit me. You can't hit me with the first question like that. Are you? That's too tough. Crazy. <laughs> Yeah, that's really hard. Okay, Beyonce, 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 Beyonce. Rest in peace. Oh my gosh, that's so I feel. I felt sick. <laughs> in my I didn't stomach saying that. Run the I clock. Didn't mean to put you in that predicament. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. Oh, ball out of bounds. Take a timeout. Media timeout. All right, we're back. So there's, I think, twenty seconds left. Okay. Football or basketball? Basketball. March Madness or NBA playoffs? Oh. <laughs> Yo, but this this year in the bubble, if we could get that same energy next year and the year after that, I might go NBA, but March Madness is a time and it never disappoints. So we're gonna go March Madness. Okay. Heels or sneakers? Sneakers. Dress. The only reason why I wear heels is because I'm five three. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> okay. Dresses or or like sweats? Sweats. Jamaican food or Italian food? Please, Jamaican. <laughs> I was actually didn't ask that. <laughs> uh, comedy. That was, a, that was a lob. Like <laughs> <laughs> comedies or action movies? Oh, uh, action movies! Because half the comedies y'all think are funny actually aren't funny. Okay. Okay. Last one before the tie goes out. Uh, Hockey or baseball? Hockey people hate me already. Let's go with actually, <laughs> but I will go with hockey. Actually, surprise. Oh, really? Yeah, it's just, I didn't. I didn't see that coming. Yeah, I do. I I do enjoy the quickness of hockey way more than I enjoy the slowness of baseball. Okay, baseball's got to figure out a way, man. Um. Okay, last one, especially because you have a, you're, you know, you're a young mother and you have, and probably, I've seen your son on Instagram, you know, beautiful young son. What, okay. which holiday would you prefer, Christmas or Thanksgiving? Uh, Christmas, because Thanksgiving is racist as F. Okay, that's, that's fair. That's, <laughs> I agree. I agree. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know extremely humbled by the opportunity first of all the fact that you reached out when i got hurt um you know i was receiving a lot of love and support from a lot of people but you know getting there from you it meant a lot to me especially like i said past couple of years looking up to you especially in the space that i want to get into when i'm done playing basketball and just seeing how you're able to navigate um through this career being a strong young black woman uh means the world to me and my family especially so i just want to thank thank you and appreciate you for being on my show Appreciate you. This is amazing. Don't worry, you're going to be taking anybody's spot soon. <laughs>